Okay, we're rolling. All right, this is a home interview in Baldwin, New York. It is the 8th of August, 2006. Approximately 10 a.m. Interviewers are Mike Russell and Dave Farr. Could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? Oh, hold on until after the airplane. Okay, go ahead. Your name and... My name is Edward Oliveira. Uh, my age is 83. Where were you born? Uh, I'm uh, uh, August 26, 1922. And, uh, Where? I was born in New York City. Okay. What was your educational background prior to entering service? Uh, I was I did grade school in in the Bronx, and I was in James Monroe High School when the war broke out. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was the first. Volunteer from James Monroe High School uh, to volunteer. Uh, volunteered on the uh, December the 27th, 1941. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> so obviously, going into service at that time. You must have been affected by Pearl Harbor. Do you remember where you were when oh, yes. you heard about oh, Pearl yes. Harbor? Oh, yes. I write it here. <coughs> I was in a movie theater on December the 7th. It was a beautiful day, actually. A mild day, even though it was December. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was watching a uh, Fred Astaire and Ginger Roger picture. I remember that. And then the, uh, <coughs> they cut off the film. Mm -hmm. And the house lights went on, and the manager came out, and the way he was walking, uh, he, you know, sadly, and uh, I think he was even crying, I don't know. And then he announced that uh, the Japanese had uh, attacked us in Pearl Harbor, and uh, all military personnel had to report immediately mm -hmm. to, uh, to their bases. Did and you know where Pearl Harbor was? That was the next thing. Everybody turned around and said, where's Pearl Harbor? Uh, and, uh, then the film went on and I saw the rest of it. And uh, when I went outside, uh, you see at that time they didn't have uh, uh, TVs or mm -hmm. And people, the only ones that had radios would be taxi cabs. And uh, everybody was around the taxi cab listening to the news. And always the same question, where the hell is Pearl Harbor? following day, which was the 8th, I went to school, Monday the 8th, and uh, they heard us into the assembly, and they had the radio hooked up so that we could hear uh, Franklin Roosevelt mm -hmm. ask Congress for a declaration of war. And uh, <clears throat> then after that, uh, I went up to my first class, which was an English class, and the, the teacher was uh, Mrs. Mr. Sutton, and I'll never forget, he, he was an, a real Englishman, a live Englishman who had served in World War I, and he was crying. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I don't know, he pointed at me, uh, uh, every one of you young men is going to be involved in this war. And I want you to remember one thing. Oh, he said, our country is at war. And I want you to remember one thing, and when things get rough, this too shall pass away. And then he dismissed the class. And no sooner did he dismiss the class, the air raid siren went off. Uh, and from New York City, you know, and everybody was running around like chickens with their heads off. And uh, I finally went home. And I'll never forget my, my mother, God bless her. She turned around to me when I got home, and she said to me, where do the women sign up to fight this war? See, my mother was Mexican, and she had been involved with the, with the Pancho Villa army oh. in Mexico, and women were so gaga down mm -hmm. there. So she thought, it, and I said, Mom, only the men fight the war up here in the United States. <clears throat> Little did I know that they were going to have women waxed and things of that mm -hmm. nature. But anyhow, on the 27th, I, I managed to talk my mother and father into letting me enlist. 
and uh, and uh, on the 27th I signed up and the uh, next thing you know uh, no, no, you enlisted. Why did you pick the Army? Oh, I didn't want the Army. I oh. wanted the Navy. Uh-huh. And uh, they were very strict then. If you, you had glasses, no Navy. So I walked across the street and I joined the Army. And a lot of guys did. I mm -hmm. saw grown men who were uh, colorblind. I never knew that they were colorblind and the Navy wouldn't take them because they couldn't read the signal flags. Oh, uh -huh. and, um, so anyhow, the, uh, the next day I was uh, on a train in Penn Station, about 500 uh, volunteers, and uh, they were shipping us out here to Long Island to Camp Upton. And uh, <laughs> that was some train ride. Because uh, I was a kid, 18, and they, these guys were in their 30s. Is this your first time away from home? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, they were drinking and card playing and everything else. And uh, we got to the camp and uh, got off the train. And then there was a sergeant there, uh, Sergeant Young. And Sergeant Young eventually ended up in my office. And uh, he gave us our first military orders to line us up. And then he said, turn around, he didn't say about face, he just said, turn around. And it retreat, 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And, uh, All right, let, let's stop for a second. And then they, uh, he said, salute the flag, retreat. And then after that, they marched us through the shed. And they gave us um, heavy white sheet woolen blankets from World War One, And uh, then they marched us about two miles to the old barracks that were left over from World War One. The floors had two spaces in between them. And there was a pop belly stove on one end and a pop belly stove on the other end. And then we were supposed to keep warm. Mm -hmm. And I was a good little boy. I made my bed military style and the sergeant came in and looked around and everybody was sitting around twiddling their thumbs and he looked at me and said, how'd you learn to make a bed? I thought I was in an orphanage for about seven years and I used to make beds. And, well, show these guys how to make the bed. <laughs> and so we did. In any case, uh, it was too cold. We all stuck with our clothes on that night. That cold. And, uh, now, did you have coal for the for the stoves? Coal or wood for the stoves? Oh no, no, they didn't even have wood or coal. Everybody, you know, it was it was chaotic. Uh -huh. The whole the whole country was chaotic from top to bottom. And then about three days later, put us on a train and shipped us to uh, uh, Fort Eustis, Virginia. And uh, the barracks there were a hell of a lot better because they were uh, stone brick buildings, two story high, very fancy. Mm -hmm. And uh, we stayed there for, uh, for three days and they put us on guard duty. This was the funniest thing of all. They gave us uh, uh, bolt action O3 rifles, also from World War I. No ammunition. And they, uh, uh, they had uh, bayonets on them. They showed us how to put the bayonets on them. And they put us on guard duty <coughs> to guard these, uh, these railroad guns that, uh, that protected Washington, D.C. Now, the damn things, I could see there was rust all over them. And they, I doubt if they, <coughs> they had a crew to even fire these damn things for ammunition. <laughs> so we, we, or I'm sorry, were you given uniforms also at the time? Uh, yes. No, we had fatigue. No uniforms. We just had fatigue. <clears throat> World War One fatigue. I don't know where they came from, but they weren't. They smelled the high heavens. But anyhow, the uh, the uh, 
we wore our civilian clothes underneath them, you know, because it was cold. Mm -hmm. Cold and damp there. And uh, here we are doing our guard duty as best we could. And uh, so we, it, it, was a, it was a real farce. The Germans could have walked in. The Germans or the Japs could have walked into Washington, D.C. Little did they know how unprotected we were at that time. And then about two days later, they began the basic training. Uh, our first basic training. Mm -hmm. And for one month, we trained diligently there. And then finally, uh, they shipped us to what is now Fort Stone. And at that time, it was Camp Stone. Mm -hmm. and just, uh, uh, it had just been uh, started. Now, what, what state was that in? Oh, Georgia. Georgia. Okay. State of Georgia, and I was all, I was I was assigned to an anti-aircraft unit, the 902nd AA Battalion, and that battalion was a training battalion, mm -hmm. and they made up of, uh, of uh, anti-aircraft artillery, uh, 40 millimeter guns, 50 caliber machine guns. Uh, Ninety millimeter guns and searchlights. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I was just, I was assigned to the searchlight unit. And you, you ever go to a, an opening of a theater? Yeah. It was a big searchlight mm -hmm. like that, sixty inch. Watch uh, what I don't know at the time. Mm -hmm. That's cool. And uh, here we are. Uh, the place that you know, it was months of real training. You know. Mm -hmm. Hard training in, in Georgia. The mud and uh, rain and, uh, and, uh, but the, and guard duty at night. And uh, the place reeked of soft coal because that's what they heated mm -hmm. up in barracks with. And you had that smell in your nose all the time. And so. What happened uh, about after about six months of this training, uh, I had enough of it. And they, <clears throat> they called for volunteers for special units. They were organized, and uh, it was an airborne unit. And oh boy, my ears went up! Rah rah rah! And uh, needless to say, I volunteered, and I ended up in what was to be my regular unit for the remainder of the war. Uh, 683rd AA Airborne Company. We love that airborne. So. And there you got more training. Uh, it was very, very intense. Did you get any uh, parachute training? No, we got into a plane once. We weren't supposed to jump. We were just supposed to be carried from point A to point B in a plane. And then unload and uh, our, our mission was to protect an airfield. Mm -hmm. The airfield. We get out and we set up our guns on each side of the runway uh, to protect the airfield. Because a lot of the airfields were uh, were uh, makeshift things, and uh, uh, and uh, as actually. When we finally finished training, we had everything packed, ready to go. Little did I know that we were supposed to go to uh, Africa, the landing in Africa. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the last moment, they took out my unit, uh, the 681st to the 684th, each unit. Each unit, I forgot to tell you, each unit was made up of uh, 85 enlisted men. Five officers and uh, 12 50 caliber machine guns. And uh, <clears throat> that was a one unit, plus a corp, a company corps, and all that sort of thing. And uh, we were issued Thompson submachine guns. I don't know who will throw that one up, but boy, we thought we were the cats in the house. Run it all over the place. Anyhow, 560 men in the other units from the 685th on 
they, they eventually went to Africa, and we later learned that they did try to protect these airfields, but the Germans were too good for them, wiped them all out. Yes. And they were dismembered, and they ended up in the infantry because uh, they were no longer useful. <clears throat> Anyhow, the rest of us, the 681st to the 684, uh, we were put on a train, and off we went to the West Coast. That was four companies. And we ended up at a place called Fort Stoneman, C-O-N-E-M-A-N. Uh, I guess this was a gathering place for troops. Mm -hmm. And uh, north of uh, San Francisco. And uh, we stayed there about two days. And one morning, we, they got us up at 4 o'clock, like they always do, and uh, lined us up. We had our breakfast, and then we were marched to a nearby uh, road. We stayed there until 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Finally, they marched us down to the dock, a ferry boat. Put us on the, put us on the ferry boat to go down the Stoneman River and uh, to the San Francisco Harbor. And, uh, and I write down here, I, I remember how scared I was. Plain time was over. This was for real. The army band was playing patriotic tunes. People were cheering and waving flags. And I was a frightened kid, 19, on my way to war. First time that this really, really sunk into me. Playtime was over. And we got down to the dock about nine o'clock in the evening and uh, at a big long shed. And uh, we marched us through the shed. And all I saw was a big black wall and a little doorway. And that was the side of the ship. And then we went up up the deck and staircase after staircase and here we're carrying these Thompson submachine guns, our duffel bags which were fully loaded, and going upstairs, upstairs, upstairs. We finally got to what uh, promenade deck and uh, they marched us into the uh, what used to be the promenade uh, dining room. And there was three tiers of uh, bunks lying to me. And I climbed up into the top one, dropped everything, and went to sleep. I was exhausted. And I think everybody else was. It wasn't until the next morning that we discovered that we were on the Ile de France. And we sailed about, oh, 11 o'clock in the morning of November the, I think it was on. November the 3rd, 1942. And we're going under the Golden Gate Bridge and there bridges loaded with people waving and shouting and flags waving and everything. And I think to myself, you know, they had that saying, loose, loose lips sink ships. Mm -hmm. I was saying, what is all this about? And we got out into the water and there was one little naval vessel to escort us out, a Coast Guard boat. And we didn't go very far. But I, of course what it was is that they, the other fronts could outrun anything that they had. You know. <laughs> we did. About three to four days. I never did, could figure out if it was three or four days. Uh, we, did, we sailed into Pearl Harbor and right into the channel. Battleship Road Channel, and uh, they docked us in Battleship Road, and from the deck we could see the Arizona and the Oklahoma and all the other damage and everything. And as soon as we docked, two tugs came with anti anti submarine nets around our ship. It was quite an quite a thing, you know. This is real. This is, this is where it started. Mm -hmm. And uh, next day we sailed out. And 
We still didn't know where the hell we were going. That was the big secret. Where were we going? And we all figured we were going to the island. And we were about two days out before they told us we were going to India. What the hell are we going to India for? And uh, we kept sailing south and south and south. Oh, you gotta, you, you gotta understand what this is about. Here is 9,000, maybe 10,000 troops, American troops on this ship. Most of them, 900 of us were uh, combat troops. The rest of them were all engineer troops, railroads. Mm -hmm. and they were going to Iran to build the railroad from southern Iran into Russia. And, uh, the rest of us were going into India, and, uh, and so we had American troops on a French ship with an English crew, English rations, which were vile, and uh, Hindu cooks. Mm. And when we got to Pearl Harbor, the Hindu cooks were out the door, and they put American cooks there to cook this rations and try and make them a little bit more edible. And, uh, Why don't you show us your picture of the Hilda France and show me where you, you said you spent well, most of your time. Well, when we got to Pearl Harbor, they took all the machine guns out, uh, out of the hole, and mounted them all over the ship mm -hmm. for anti-aircraft protection. My gun was right on the fan tail. Right on the fan tail. And that's where I slept most of the trip over. Which it was so hot on that mm -hmm. ship, there was no air conditioning and very few fans for the for the troops. And uh, so we went over there, uh, uh, and we got into a storm, a terrible, terrible storm. I don't know if people know the Atlantic Ocean; the waves go up and down. But in the Pacific Ocean, the waves are long waves. They build up and they drop down. Mm -hmm. And this, this ship was being picked up and dropped. For three days. Finally, we see get seasick at all? Oh, seasick. Let me tell you, when we, ate, we ate two meals a day. That was it. And my meal came about 11 o'clock in the morning and 2 o'clock in the afternoon. You'd go down and this is a luxury ship, remember. Mm -hmm. and they didn't take everything out. They still had the big mirrors and they had the chandelier hanging up. And we went down and what was the main dining salon. We went down these stairs. Did you remember the picture of Titanic? Yeah. yeah. Those stairs, mm -hmm. that was the same stairs we went down. We went down those stairs on one side, and you walk through the main, uh, dining room, and they had take, uh, benches uh, uh, bolted to the deck, mm -hmm. and long tables. Uh, but above it was portholes. So when we were in the storm, you could see the peripheral vision, you could see the water going up and down. We go through this main hall and so that you'd go through the uh, main hall, go into the kitchen around there, and they would slop the stuff into your uh, tin uh, mess kit. That's all we had. We didn't have any dishes or anything. And then you'd go around. And they had GI cans where you were supposed to dip your mess kit to clean it out after you finished and, and then go back to wherever you were. Those uh, GI cans were frequently loaded with vomit. And the guys would get seasick, you know, because the ship was going up and down. I tell you the honest truth. Before that trip was over, my gun school, anyhow, was eating raw potato sandwiches. Couldn't go down to that. 
I forgot to tell you, on the fan tail over here, you just about to see it. The, the platform. You just about to see it. And on that was a six inch gun that the British had mounted with a the British crew on. And we always laughed at it. It said, oh boy, some protection. If we ever ran into a Jap cruiser or a Jap submarine, they'd make mincemeat of us. So anyhow, it was December the 24th now. And the ship was really going up and down. And suddenly there was a wham! The whole ship shook. And it listed. I was sleeping downstairs by this time, incidentally. We were sleeping in hammocks. And uh, somebody said, Jesus Christ, they got us. Uh, he says, Jesus Christ, they got us. And I remember my training. This was, this is something, because we had been trained. I remember I said to myself, okay, don't panic. Don't panic. And I loosened the uh, laces on my shoe, my boots, and loosened the belt of my buckle of my shoe, my pants, because they showed us how when we jumped overboard you could use it for like catch air, you know, mm -hmm. and, and you could fold on that. Mm -hmm. And I said, what else you flashlight and make sure you have water and don't panic. And about that time, uh, the captain of our unit came down and said, don't worry, we were not struck by a submarine, uh, a torpedo rather. Uh, what happened was the cargo had shipped. And the following day, and they ordered us up right up to the deck, up to the port side of the ship. Everybody had to get on the port side so that the ship might just, uh, you know, mm -hmm. right itself. And we were sailing in this December the 25th, 7 o'clock in the morning, we are sailing into the entrance to the harbor of Wellington, New Zealand. And the beaches were on each side of these entrance and crowded with people. And the people were going crazy, absolutely crazy, cheering, everything, you know. And the ship sailed majestically into, and they, all they saw was American troops. And the Jets were already bombing Fort Darwin in Australia, and they were marching down to the Philippines, and the New Zealanders thought that maybe they'd come into New Zealand. And, you know, that's the hysteria mm -hmm. at that time. And we stayed there for about three or four days. And the first day, everybody was ordered into, uh, that was Christmas Day, uh, everybody was ordered into Class A uniform, and they marched us through the Wellington Museum. People were free. Anything you wanted, you could have. And, uh, <laughs> They marched us to the theater. Their best theater would be like the uh, Radio City Music Hall. And they showed us a picture, Mrs. Minerva. <laughs> I'll never forget that one. And then we got back and they served us a, a turkey dinner and, and, uh, on, on board ship. Right? Best meal we had in the whole trip. <laughs> and. Uh, then when we sailed from Wellington, New Zealand, they must have, oh, and then the second day we were able to march, uh, move around the city uh, in units, uh, in units, and uh, but not alone, we wanted scattering all over the place. So uh, we went up a big hill, Wellington is a beautiful city, it was a lot of hills, very much like San Francisco. And uh, we got to the top of this hill, and uh, there was a store there, a little store, a country store, like a delicate. And the officer went in and asked the 
owner, he said that our men would like to buy some goodies in here, you know, and he has some damn good goodies. And, uh, but we don't have any uh, of your local currency, but we have a lot of American money. And he said, uh, would you mind if I put my office behind the counter and they will charge the same price as you would serve in the United States. So he agreed to it. And we emptied out that store, to say the least. I, I got a, a jelly roll about that long and a quart of milk. Now, the milk there is not the skinny stuff that we have here. It's thick, heavy milk, real milk. And uh, we were all drinking it, you know, and that resident. And, uh, the results was that many a man had diarrhea before they got the degree or hadn't had anything like that. Mm -hmm. Well, anyhow, we sailed and we went down further south around Tasmania, the island of Tasmania, into the northern part of the Antarctica Ocean and up to Perth, Australia. And we stopped there for one day. Earth is on the uh, west coast of Australia. At that time, it was a little cow town. Now it's a city. Mm -hmm. And uh, we stayed there one day. They refueled the ship and all. And uh, when we sailed that the next day, <coughs> we spotted a uh, Japanese flying boat. One of these huge flying boats and uh, of course we went on alert immediately everybody was red alert and everybody had jackets on there and we were waiting for the inevitable because the cruiser would come over the horizon or something like that nothing came and the only reason i could figure it out is that they were so overextended they had no submarine or cruiser that far south and uh, a few days later, we ended up uh, off the coast of India, uh, Bombay, India. Now, how long was the entire trip? Oh, approximately. Uh, I'll tell you in a minute. I think it was. And this is only guessing. Mm -hmm. The whole thing took about. Oh, oh, here it is. It was February. It, it was. It took about. When did I say November? Yeah. And we ended up in uh, in Bombay in the last latter part, of, uh, beginning of January. So that would be what thirty, forty days. Mm -hmm. Thirty to forty days. And, uh, it was a long trip, I know that. And uh, then they took the other four souls, had to go further yet to Iran, in Iraq. Uh, Iran, man. And uh, then. Uh, they took us off the machine guns and everything, put us on barges because the ship couldn't go into the port. There was not enough water there for us. And uh, they put us on troop train, what they call troop train. The cockroaches were at least an inch long, and plenty of them. And then we began to feel the, uh, the, uh, the culture of nightmare on India. I put it, it was now January 1943. The trip across India was a culture nightmare, a real eye-opener for us American troops. I always thought my family in South Bronx was was poor, 
but in India showed me what really, what poor really meant. The heat was unbearable, the stench of death, disease, and filth were all magnified by it. The noise of music, people and animals could be heard as loud and clear as if they were on the train with us. The first Indian word we learned was bakshi. which was the call of the beggars. And uh, the soldiers, we threw coins out of them, you know. The more coins we got, the more boxes. And this went on, I, I see, it was a heartbreaking scene. The sights we saw all across India, and I'm talking about five-day trips across India. Uh, the masses uh, were there all the time. Boxing, boxing. And some of the sites you saw were terrible. I mean, wounds and, uh, and women holding up their emaciated babies. And, uh, we got to Calcutta after five days, and there it was again hundreds of babies and prostitutes, the likes of which would quell any. And even the greatest of desires, I <laughs> And the next day we headed north, and I think it was a, uh, until we got a large river, a very, very large river, a very wide, like the Mexican, mm -hmm. and learned that that was the farm of Putin. And they, uh, we pulled alongside another train, and we had to unload our train to their train, of course, the gauges were different gauges. And uh, then we, uh, we, we began to go north again. And we entered a plateau, flat. And we saw high hedges, like this. High hedges. Mm -hmm. And uh, we later learned that there were some tea plants. And tea plants go like this. Just like that. And one on top of the other, and in between there's rows where these tea planters would go in and pick the tea. The, the tea that was ready to be picked. And uh, the American military had uh, carved out about five or six airfields. And those were the fields that they used to supply the Chinese flying the home. Mm -hmm. And we were going there to protect one of the airfields, that's the other three too. And uh, we began to see the planes overhead, American planes. And uh, we were assigned, my unit was assigned to a place called Dinjan, D-I-N-J-A-N. And uh, it was a big field, about the size of uh, the one in Queens. Mm -hmm. And uh, not enough in the end. And uh, we put up our guns as quickly as we could. And the, uh, the, uh, the, the airfield, the airfield. The Air Corps, they were Air Corps then. The Air Corps personnel kept saying, hurry, hurry, get those guns up, get those guns up. Uh, because it was dry season, and they expected air raids any time. And our first air raid was uh, February 14th, Valentine's Day. And I'll read it out, it's easier that way. February 14th, Valentine's Day, dawn bright, hot, and clear. About 10 in the morning, we heard a steady roar of aircraft engines followed by the howl of air raid siren, we sighted high-flying bombers. I jumped into the harness of our gun. There were about 29 bombers in all. They were much too high for our machine guns. What we did not see were the Jap Zeros at three levels streaking in over the, our field. I opened fire at once. The enemy planes <coughs> were firing at anything they could see. Planes on the ground were hit, as were many buildings. 
There was a lot of noise and total pandemonium. The sound of exploding bombs was intermingled with the rattle of our machine guns. The anti-aircraft machine guns put up a curtain of fire. My gun was soon red hot. I could hear Corporal Sal. Corporal Sal was the charge of our group. Corporal Sal behind me screaming, lead, lead, lead. And my, my buddy Kenny was feeding the gun belt of ammunition into the gun in a very calm manner. I, rem I remember he had a smile on his face as if he was enjoying the whole event. <clears throat> I was firing my gun at any zero that came into my line of fire. My glasses fell off, but that did not matter to me. I spotted a jab zero about 20 feet above the main runway. This propeller was scattering gravel in all directions. I noticed that he was halfway down the runway. He pulled up and flew off with a trail of smoke in the rear of the plane. The, bomb, the bombers in the meantime dropped their bombs. Most of the bombs landed in the nearby tea uh, patches. All the action took place within 10 minutes and then suddenly it was over. All that was left the smoke from burning planes and buildings. I realized I had pissed all over myself and began to cry. Our crew checked each other, then we either laughed hysterically or we cried. We had been blooded. And I hadn't known, I, I hadn't known if we shot any planes down, but the Air Force personnel tell us, told us we shot down at about six to zero. The Air Force no longer was snide, made snide remarks about our pop guns. <laughs> the next day, Chabwa, that's another airfield, which was about 10 miles away, got hit. On the 16th of February, our field was hit again. The Zeros kept at a respectable height. Sometimes, uh, some tried to break through, but were quickly driven off by a wall of fire from our guns. On the following day, on the following day, the Japanese sent over 40 bombers over off the airfield. Uh, our fighters had been alerted; they were made up of P-40s, and they were ready and waiting for them uh, high in the sky. The Japanese always were very funny. The Air Force was very funny. They flew their planes always at the same altitude, which is about 29,000 feet, and never deviated one way or the other. Mm. Uh, every bomber did not have a bomb site. Only the lead bomber had a bomb site. So he would fly in, and they would always come in, make a real curve, and then come down, and the bomb leader, the, the leader would drop his bomb, mm -hmm. and the others would go after him. That's the way they did it. Our fighters were above them, and uh, they pounced on jet formation, shooting down many of them. There were bombers falling everywhere. Rumor had it that all 40 bombers had either been shot down or damaged. I can only say that the flyboys were the real heroes of the CBI, that day. And uh, then, there was, uh, then there were, uh, there were many there were no more heavy raids after that massacre. Maybe a few sneak raids or four planes at the most. Boredom set in. And, um, and uh, sometimes heavy, it, 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 it rained constantly day after day. And then they meditate. Now what, what kind of shelters did you live in? Uh, we had pretty good barracks, better, better than this. Well, could you hold that up and... Better than that. Mm -hmm. Now, what is that made of? Bamboo. Bamboo. All bamboo. Everything in India is made of bamboo. <laughs> the temporary... Now, what's the roofing material? Uh, that was, uh, canvas. Oh. That was it. Mud floor. Mm -hmm. uh, there would be 
three, three, three uh, tiers of bunks inside. Very crowded. Little room. Did you get it? Yes. And uh, we lived in that one there for 11 months. And uh, oh, the most exciting thing that happened during that period was that we had a we went to a massive earthquake. And uh, that was a funny thing. I was on duty that night. And we're all sitting there. Uh, the other guys were in the bunks sleeping, and, and I'm writing a letter. And suddenly, I my ears perked up. It was about nine o'clock in the evening, and there was a full moon. And my ears perked up and said, "Damn, that sounds like a, a subway going through the tunnel." And next thing, all this happened one, two, three. I realized that the corrugated uh, steel shower that we had built outside was rattling and I knew instantly what it was. So I yelled out, earthquake! Six naked bodies flying <laughs> out of the a little doorway. And I remember I grabbed the, the gas lamp and I'm holding it up because I'd seen in, in movie pictures that the earth opens up. <laughs> I didn't want to fall into one of those holes. And uh, the big transport planes are jumping up and down, and, and then it was all over. The following morning, we, we could see clearly the, the Himalaya Mountains, and the whole country of the Himalaya Mountains had been changed, what we could see. And we later learned two rivers in uh, in India, two main rivers in India had been changed, and the casualties, they kept it quiet because of the war. At least 400,000 people had been wiped out. They had a sumari come down on each river, and these people lived right on the edge of the water. Wiped out everything. It was a horrible thing, I guess. Anyhow, December 43 came around, and we were ordered to pack up our guns. <laughs> and I write out here, immediately the rumor mill opened up. We were, we were going to be shipped out to Philippines, we were going to be shipped out to Europe, we were going to be shipped back to America, and uh, we were all wrong. We got on a plane, and the next thing you know, we were flying over the Naga Hills, and onto a dirt and gravel runway in the middle of the jungle in a place called Shimbuyang in Burma, northern Burma. And uh, our mission, of course, was to set up our guns and protect us from the And the, the runway was a funny runway. We ran uphill. We were on a hill so that Fly, it was like landing and taking landing and taking off uh, aircraft carrier. The drop at the south end it was a big drop, and that's the way they were. And uh, when we landed, it was cold. I remember it was very cold, even though it was warm. We unloaded the guns and everything. And uh, what happened was that. We were very, very depressed, to tell you the truth. <laughs> Why? Well, one, we didn't know what, what the hell were we doing here. And we could hear the guns. Oh, yeah, we could hear the uh, the field guns in the, in the distance. Uh, the front lines was not too far away. And uh, we're making coffee that night over an open fire. We hear a voice say, that coffee smells good, can I have a cup of coffee? And we all looked up to see who the idiot was who wanted a cup of coffee. And it was General Stillwell. And there he was, campaign hat, boots, the whole works. Tall, thin man. And 
That's true. We all jumped and said, no, 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 don't. He didn't have no insignia on him. Mm -hmm. He says, I don't want no sniper killing me. And uh, we gave him coffee and then he talked to each one of us, where are you from, what are you doing here, what, you know, like the general does, morale. Mm -hmm. huh. Yes, Rory, can I have it from the icebox? No, thank you. And, uh, He was good. He was a good man. And then we learned later on that he had been fired because uh, he dared to call Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek the little bandit, the peanut. And uh, the whole, you got to understand what the background of China was, was at that time. The whole, uh, the whole background of that political background was the Sung family. And the Sung family came to me from the United States, brothers and sisters and everything, and they controlled Congress. Mm -hmm. They got a lot of money. Madam Chang is still alive. She lives up here in Glencoe. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, I thought she passed away. No, she's still up there. As last I heard, oh. she was a hundred and something. She, she was a charmer. Mm -hmm. She charmed everybody. Anyhow, that's why uh, the general discovered that. He, he didn't mix with these people. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. We stayed in there, in that place, and our nearest. You got to understand what this was. This was a jungle strip. I lived in that building there for 11 months. And uh, our nearest neighbor was the Nagas, the Naga headhunters. And the first time we saw them, I was cleaning the gun and I turned around and I looked and there were three of them sitting there and they were looking at me, squatting down, looking at me. And they only had on with a loincloth, a derby hat, and a big, look, wicked looking knife. And they were headhunters, and they still had hunted heads then. Mm -hmm. And the British government paid them 30 rupees, silver rupees, for every jack head that they brought in. And their women, and their women loved the uh, silver rupees. The silver rupees, not paper money. Uh -huh. And they would make necklaces. And uh, they never said a word. We look at them, they look at us. We go off them cigarettes, which they love. They love the American cigarettes. And then they disappeared. They never said anything. And it was quite a, quite a adventure. My, uh, my, my outfit was made up of. My, my outfit was made up of, uh, okay? Yep. My outfit was made up of, of 85 men. And I think six of us were Stan Yankees. And the rest of them were all Southern. From the hills of Tennessee, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia, any, any, and our cook was from Tennessee. And he was, uh, he was a character. And his nose was splattered all over his face. Ugliest looking man you ever wanted to see. And he had been a cook in a um, lumberjack prior to the war. And his one big failing was that if it was female, he ran after her. And uh, he got into a lot of trouble because of it. But he was a damn good cook. He knew how to cook. And uh, he always said, yeah, Christ, you guys are always making fun of me. <laughs> and one thing these Southerners knew how to make is whiskey. And he, this cook, would trade our uh, sugar to the black troops down the road, black engineer troops, for the raisins. We had raisins. 
And the razors, of course, we never saw again. They were in the, in the sewer. We had a sewer in the, in the jungle. And uh, everybody knew about it. And uh, the officers would get a bottle of uh, cutty stuff or something. One, one bottle a month. And they would come down from their area and they would trade a bottle of cutty stuff for one gallon of this horrible moonshine. And I could never understand that because I wasn't drinking at the time. <coughs> oh, they do it. And of course I knew, now I know it's because it lasted longer and they could put orange juice or grapefruit juice in it. But we were always well supplied with whiskey. But did you have much sickness among your oh, men? Yeah. Oh, yeah. We had much. I developed malaria. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a lot of. Uh, uh, we lost a few fellows for uh, what we call Section 8. Uh, we were never dry. How about your feet? Did you have trench foot? Oh, yeah, trench foot and all that. Mm -hmm. And uh, morale was low, low. Christmas came. Uh, uh, 44, I think it was. Yeah. Christmas of 44 came. Uh, we were in the jungle there. I'd been there one year by that time. And it went. But nothing could come in. The fog was down on the runway. Mm -hmm. and in January, uh, in January, uh, a plane did manage to land. And when he taxied over, he asked if there was a 683 there. And we told him yes. He said, I got a plane load of mail and Christmas gifts for you. Party started. And I'm not forgetting. Corporal Sal had a uh, Italian background, and his family sent him a whole box of spaghetti and meatballs. We made we heated this. We made the spaghetti in a pail. And the sauce was made in a galvanized uh, thing that we had where we washed our faces and everything. And, it was, and then we, Kenny, my buddy, who was a uh, health nut, his mother and father sent him a bottle, of, a big bottle of uh, yeah. Ovaltine. <laughs> and, oh, I want this thing. Yeah, he gave it to me. And I opened it up and took one whiff. Nice. You better take some bourbon. <laughs> and I said, your mother and father were smarter than you think. <laughs> and, and off to the races we went. We, the Japs could have walked in any time they wanted. But those are the kind of things we had. We had no we had no uh, USO. The only person of any note that ever came over there was Pat O'Brien. When he got on the stage, he was so drunk he almost fell off the stage. <laughs> and uh, anyhow, it was it was hard, hard. Our movies we watch in the pouring rain. The camera would be covered, the screen would be covered, and we'd be sitting there in the pouring rain watching Betty Grable dance or something like that. And. Uh, the audience was usually made up of American troops, uh, British troops, Chinese troops, uh, Hindu sheiks, uh, you name it, they were made up there. Finally, uh, we were ordered to get our guns together again and get ready to ship out. And. Uh, The officers were ordered to to uh, headquarters for final, and they came back in the jeeps. The jeeps were going wild. They were screaming and yelling and everything. 
We're going home. We're going home. And uh, it was May. And, uh, this was 45. Yeah, 45. Mm -hmm. And two days later, we were on a plane to Calcutta. Calcutta. And uh, we landed on the night that Germany surrendered. Oops. <laughs> okay, we're rolling. Hey, uh, when we got to uh, Calcutta, it was VE night. I was so tired, I laid down on the bunk that they say. We were in camp in a temporary camp mm -hmm. in a park in Calcutta. And uh, they had some bunks there, and I just laid on one of the bunks and I slept like two days. <laughs> The two days later, they, a day later, next day as a matter of fact, uh, they marched us down to, uh, they took us down to a nearby dock and there was a military ship there and uh, we were marching down the dock, it was a big long dock, and there was the crew members of this ship, Coast Guard, and, and they were nice white uniforms and they were in good health, nice tan. And looking down at us, and they told us we looked like the walking dead when we got down because we were so thin, our uniforms hung on us. We didn't think there was anything wrong with us, the people. And we got onto the ship, and... Uh, now, did you take your equipment with you, or did you leave all of it behind? I left it all behind. I never did find out what happened to us. I never did find out what Maybe still in Burma for all I know. <laughs> and uh, we were all uh, dark brown skin with a yellowish tint uh, from the Atterbury and mm -hmm. we had to take mm -hmm. After that was over, we got on board ship and they fed us. And they put all this food in front of us. We looked at it, we all grabbed it and butter. Stuffing it into our mouth. One of the crew members said, Jesus Christ, what did they do to you? And then uh, the ship sailed, it was uneventful, and uh, we went to, from Calcutta to Ceylon, from Ceylon up through the Red Sea, the Suez Canal, and then finally uh, the Mediterranean and then the Atlantic Ocean. And then we uh, sailed to Newport News. And we landed. And the minute we got off the ship, they marched us to the nearby theater. Locked the doors, put guards on the doors. And a, uh, a man got up and identified himself from, as being from New York, from the United States the State Department. And he ordered us, you will not tell anybody what you saw in China Burma Kenya. It's a state secret. And if you do, you'll be caught off with, etc., etc. Then they marched us to the mess hall, and uh, that's where I saw my first prisoner of war. German PW was serving us food. And they looked in better health than we did. And uh, two days later, they gave me the, uh, uh, my uh, leave, 30-day leave, uh, and I came up to New York, Penn Station. Uh, I was absolutely confused, and a taxi cab driver in the yellow cab came up to me and said, he'd, give me, he'd take me to the Bronx at half price. And Good. So he did. And he told me that he had a, a son in the Pacific somewhere, he didn't know where. And I wanted to give him a tip, and he didn't. Well, anyhow, when we stopped, it was summer, and uh, people were sitting outside. And I remember I got out of the cab, I was paying the, off the cab driver, and I heard my cousin yell out, It's Eddie, it's Eddie. Screamed 
Then when you heard about the atomic bomb, you know, you... all I felt was at least I don't have to go to Japan. Mm -hmm. I don't have to land. I don't have to land because I saw the pictures of what happened in in, in Kalawa and, uh, and, and the other way. Mm -hmm. You're getting washed out by the sun. Can you just move over this way a little? Were you aware, yeah, of, while you were in uh, India or Burma, were you aware of events and what was going on in very you know, other theaters? Very, very little, as a matter of fact. We weren't kept up close. Mm -hmm. uh, the only way we kept up with the news was uh, the BBC. Uh, we, we could pick that up and by radio. And I'll forget, this is the BBC. Mm -hmm. And then they would radio or the news. How about your mail? Did you get that very often? Or? Not very often, mm -hmm. because uh, you know it's very difficult to yeah. get into the uh, flying in the supplies. Mail was uh, mail and supplies were very uh, scarce. Mm -hmm. The thing that they did to me was uh, frequently supplies were flown in uh, airdrops. Not by parachute, the plane would come flying in as slow as possible. Stuff was loaded at this open door and then they would push oh, no. it out. And uh, especially for uh, feed for the uh, animals, the mules and the rest of And the Chinese, we had Chinese laborers there, and they used to giggle. And and they'd get a new load of Chinese, they died by five. And the older ones would say to the younger ones, in order to be really good in this outfit, you have to catch one of those bags. Oh. And here they are, the bags were 30 and 40, maybe 50 pounds, and they'd try to catch them, and naturally they'd be splattered. And uh, the first time that happened, my office was so shook up, and he asked the Chinese officer, what are you going to do with the body? How are you going to ship it back? Ship it back, what? Push it off to the side, bury it. That's it. And, and, and they were very... Uh, I learned a great deal for, about the Chinese, and, and it was not nice. So you have to... Uh, when were you finally discharged? August 1945. Okay. And then I re-enlisted. Oh, you did? Yeah. You didn't put that down here? No. No, I didn't. You wound up in Germany. Uh, I re-enlisted, you know, in 45. At that time, thousands of people were being discharged. And uh, I had no trade, I had no real education. So I uh, re-enlisted. And... Uh, the government was very nice to me. They sent me to the vacation land of Panama. <laughs> and the barracks in Panama is super. You know, and I spent uh, two years in Panama. And then they shipped me back here. I spent about a year or so over here in Mission Field when it was still operating. Mm -hmm. And I was there the Sunday. Only was all stuff on Sunday. Uh, I was there the day that the uh, North Koreans invaded South Korea, and uh, I was the intelligence officer at the time, NCO, and my captain, who was the intelligence officer, Captain Simons, was getting his flying time in, and the general of the Mitchell Field screaming in the phone. 
at me, why didn't you tell me this was going to happen? <laughs> and I said to him, sir, we did. We did tell you a long time ago, four months ago. And the intelligence report, which was confidential, uh, and we always marked an X, what we thought the general would do, and he would initial it. And we sent it over to the city. So, uh, and then they they were going to ship me off to, to uh, Korea. But uh, there was another sergeant, Sergeant Starkey, I'll never forget him, heavy set by regular army. And uh, he didn't have any overseas time, and I already had plenty of overseas time. So off he went. And last we heard from him, he was in Pyongyang just before the Chinese broke through. And uh, they shipped me off instead to Germany. And I ended up in uh, a little town called Hof, H-O-F. And uh, Hof is just north of Bayreuth, a big upper place. And uh, it's right on the Czech border. East Germany, West Germany, and Czechoslovakia come together. And we could hear the Russian uh, uh, artillery every Saturday morning. And their, and their tanks. Um, and their little game was to run off the bar, way, pull away from the border, and then make a mad dash for the border. It was, we never knew if they were going to come across the middle of the Cold War. And finally got home about 51 and I was discharged. I, I decided I didn't want any more nervous. And I entered the civilian field. <laughs> Did you ever make use of the GI Bill? I tried to. <clears throat> and I ended up in uh, Columbia University. But I couldn't hang. So I went in, I was helping to support my mother's father. Did you ever use the 5220 club at all? Mm. I think I did. There was a brief period between the time I was discharged mm -hmm. in 45 until I re-enlisted. It was, it was good. How about, um, did you join any veterans organization? Never. No interest at all? No interest at all. I went to one or two meetings of the CDI people. No offense meant against the other veterans of CDI. But there were very, very few of them that really, they were mostly uh, what I call rear-end commandos. And, uh, I never met, for instance, the, the first and last time I ever met uh, the Marauders. Uh, I forgot to tell you about that. We uh, met the Marauders uh, when they came down from Leo, India. And uh, they were well equipped and everything like that. And they were all veterans from the South Pacific. And uh, they came to Their mission was to capture a field, an airfield, a big major airfield called Michino. And they did capture it finally. And then they turned it over to the Chinese infantry. And the Chinese infantry ran down to uh, the village of Michino, which is in the north part of Burma, where the English used to come to spend the summer away from Rangoon. And uh, they lost the town and they almost lost the airfield and they had to bring these poor guys back, some of them in the hospitals, and bring them back to recapture the field. And my organization, we were the heavy artillery to keep the Japs back. And then they, the Japs dug into Michinar town and it took almost 72 days to get it out. Mm -hmm. 
they were tenacious people. Something like today's guys, the Hal you know, and so forth. Same thing, they dug in and they stayed there, they were tenacious. Well, I guess if I was exactly the same thing after all of them, they had no place to go. They couldn't be shipped back to Japan or anything like that. Did you stay in contact with anyone that was in service with you? No. I met one guy. One guy. In my house. In the city somewhere. I was sitting down. And he was crazy. And he looked down at me. He said, say it! And I looked at him. Needless to say, we didn't go to work that day. <laughs> I'll get in touch. I'll get in touch. How do you think your time in the service changed or had an effect on your life? Like some people, not many, I became an alcoholic. Not because of that. does play tricks. Many years later, I was watching a picture of myself. And they had a scene where they are burying a veteran. And they started playing taps. And I started to cry. I started to cry. Not just cry. Everything. This was years later. We left it. We had 85 people went over with us. And 32 came back. Now that they weren't all casual. The they had sickness, mm -hmm. they assigned things of that nature. Some were psychiatric cases. But the ship I came back on, actually, the Thomas, the General Thomas, was loaded with psychiatric people. People who were being caught in the It's all in the story. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, thank you very much for your interview. Thank you very, very much for coming. Interview.